Good morning, West Coasters, and good afternoon to our Midwesterners and East Coasters. I'm Michelle Deutschman, the Executive Director of the UC National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. I want to start off by offering my congratulations to anybody in higher education who made it through this very unusual and challenging academic year. Hopefully, summertime will allow everyone time to rejuvenate before we head back to school in the fall. Today, the center kicks off the first of six fellows in the field workshops. As many of you know, each year the center selects fellows from a broad range of disciplines and backgrounds such as law, journalism, higher ed, social science, technology, and government. Fellows receive funding to con conduct research that will further the national conversation related to expression and democratic participation on college campuses. The Fellows in the Field series is an opportunity for the higher education community to dive deep into the fellows' findings and how they can be applied to your day-to-day -day work on campuses across the country. The work of the current class of fellows will be released later this week, but today you get a sneak peek at the research conducted by a team of fellows, Jill Dunlap and Ali Yao. Their research focused on an incredibly relevant topic, law enforcement, students, and free speech policies. Jill and Allie applied for and were selected for the Center Fellowship months before George Floyd's murder. So as you might imagine, their research has taken on increased urgency over the last year. Jill Dunlap is the Senior Director of Research, Policy and Civic Engagement at NASPA, the National Association of Student Affairs Administrators in Higher Education. And Alice Yao is a police officer, instructor, trainer for Chicago Police Department. Like any good lawyer, I need to start with a disclaimer. While Alice is employed by Chicago PD, the opinions she shares today and in her research are hers alone and do not represent the views of the law enforcement agency where she works. So one of the things I feel so grateful for about my role as the executive director is that I have the opportunity to get to know this in these incredible groups of fellows, um, each of whom is an interesting um, individual with a fascinating background. And that's where I'd like to start today. I'd like um, for Ali and Jill to tell us a little bit about themselves and sort of what led them to this project. And I think we'll start with Ali. Um, and I bet this is a question you get all the time, which is what led you to a career in law enforcement? Thanks, Michelle. I appreciate the disclaimer. And uh, yeah, I like to reiterate that my opinions are just my opinions. I'm not talking on behalf of my department. I'm not saying anything on behalf of my department. I'm speaking on behalf of uh, the Center for Free Speech as a fellow. And I appreciate the question. I do get that question a lot. Um, it goes back to when I was 12 years old. I had a bad experience with some officers because my family was involved in a drunk driving incident. Uh, we were hit by a drunk driver and I thought the incident could have been handled much better by these officers. So after that incident, I decided I was going to try and change things that affected me. After college, I spent five years working for Mothers Against Drunk Driving and try to change things that uh, specifically were about law. And uh, I was just spe specifically hoping to change um, DUIs and make it a felony. I worked a lot with some really great cops at Mothers Against Drunk Driving and having a conversation with them, I decided I was going to make more of a change inside the police department. I have 15 years in my department where I teach recruits every single day and I'm able to have conversations with these recruits on how an experience with an officer can change a person's life. Thank you, Ali. I appreciate your sharing that. Um, so as someone who works for a municipal PD, I'm curious what kind of led you to a study on campus law enforcement. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, sure. Um, so I'm currently a trainer for my department, um, as well as campus law enforcement, Amtrak, um, Metra, and other police departments in surrounding my city. And that's where Jill and I thought it would be a great fit to do this research. Okay, well, so we'll turn, we'll turn to Jill. And maybe Jill, you can tell us a little bit about how you got to this project and also about maybe how um, and if at all, it connected to your work with survivors of interpersonal violence when you were at UCSB. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I just, I, on behalf of Ellen, I want to say thank you so much to Michelle and Brenda and everyone at the center. This has been such an, like a phenomenal opportunity for us to really dig in on a really important issue, but also to connect with the other fellows and just a really great networking opportunity. So if any of you ever have a chance to apply, I highly encourage it. This has been just the most phenomenal year um, and being able to work with Michelle and Brenda. So in the center. So um, with you. that, I, I, you know, I came to this project after, you know, I work at NASPA currently and have for about six years. Um, but prior to that, I worked at three different institutions of higher education for about three to five years each, primarily working with survivors of sexual assault. But I, my, my professional background is in, um, you know, student affairs administration. Um, that's not my academic background. I am, my PhD is in political science, but having worked, you know, with campus administrators for 14 years prior to coming to NASPA, and now I work, you know, sort of at the national level on policy issues and that sort of thing um, with student affairs administrators that my background is very steeped in higher education and higher education administration. And so when we learned about the fellowship, it was really an opportunity to bring Allie's expertise and my expertise together to um, talk about the ways that those two um, different areas intersect on campus in really unique ways. And so that was, this was just such a great opportunity for us to dig in during a time in which these relationships can be really fraught. Uh, and so we were excited to be able to come together and with her background and my background, my background to approach this project. Um, I would say that, you know, my most recent campus that I was at was a UC campus. I was at the University of California, Santa Barbara leading their, uh, their office on advocacy and prevention around sexual violence. And I will say that, you know, I think some of the things that, that wind up missing in some of these conversations, um, and we're, you know, our, our project is really talking more about protest. And I certainly had students who were protesting, um, especially during my time at UCSB. I was there, you know, during the Obama administration when a lot of changes were happening with regard to Title IX and enforcement of that, and students really sort of speaking up and no longer hiding in the shadows if they had been impacted by sexual violence and um, holding institutions accountable. And so that looked like protest often, right? And um, occupying different buildings and, you know, forcing administrators to hear them out. And so I think I really value, uh, as a student affairs administrator, I think some administrators get a little um, wary of campus protesters <laughs> and uh, having their offices occupied. But for us, it was a really powerful way for students to have um, their voices heard after being silenced as a result of having experienced sexual violence. And so I think protest is very embedded in the work that a lot of advocates do on campus and those who are working with campus, you know, with students on campus who have experienced harm. So um, I, I appreciate that, but I also will say that the students with whom I worked very much identified with and wanted to work closely with when they decided to report our campus law enforcement, more so honestly than the local law enforcement. And that's not a dig on the local law enforcement. It was just that they felt like campus law enforcement was a part of their healing process when they wanted to go through an investigation. And they were really well trained at UCSB um, around how to, you know, look at and and um, help students investigate those those instances when they decided to, you know, pursue an investigation um, of their case. And so uh, I've always worked really closely with law enforcement just because of, you know, the fact that students sometimes want to make police reports after experiencing harm. And so they've been a, a very big part of my professional life as well in working closely with campus law enforcement from the student affairs perspective. Okay, thank you for that background. I think one more thing before we kind of dig into the study um, that would sort of help set the table is we did have a couple questions from participants come in about what is the, some of the key differences between municipal police departments and campus police departments. And I was hoping you could both speak to it. And before I let you do that, I forgot to tell all of our participants that you are welcome to drop questions into the Q&A. Um, and um, Jill, Ali, and I will do our best to integrate them into our discussion. So one of you can start by, oh, you okay. go ahead, Allie, um, a little bit about, yeah, how those two are different, high level. Sure. All right. Um, so as far as municipal, as far as like city, villages, they go with their own laws. And then you funnel it down into campus where the campus adds policy to those laws. So when we train recruits, we always say, hey, we can tell you about the law. We can tell you about how all that stuff works, but make sure when you go to your individual departments or campuses, you find out what their policy is and you have to study the policies also. So that's kind of like a, a funnel down. So laws, policies. Okay, got it. Do you want to add anything, Jill, or 
Yeah, I would just say again, you know, my my background comes from working with law enforcement in terms of a lot of Title IX issues. But I would say that because there is federal higher education policy that impacts the work of campus law enforcement, that a lot of what we were doing when I was at my most recent role on campus was training law enforcement about the Clery Act and about um, Title IX. And so I would say it's not that necessarily that campus law enforcement is better trained; they're just differently trained. So they get the you know the the same training um, you know as Ali does with a lot of the campus police through the academy. Um, but then in addition, they, they have this whole additional, you know, uh, area of knowledge that they have to be aware of with regard to the campus, like free speech policy and enforcing that, but also, um, you know, federal higher education regulations that require that, you know, administrators and law enforcement as university employees get a certain level of training. Um, and so that's, that's a, a major difference, I think, for us in terms of um, thinking about, you know, what additional knowledge they need to have in order to be on a campus. Okay, great. Um, all right, so let's dive into it and start, you know, could you share with us what were you hoping to achieve um, kind of with your study of students, law enforcement and free speech policies, and then I'll let you um, kind of take it away. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I think what we were hoping to do again is sort of bridge this gap between um, a lot of what we hear in the media and the fact that students want to protest and they often feel like campuses may not want them to do that or that they send in law enforcement in order to stifle their freedom of expression. And so we were really trying to get at um, from the center the the center point of our study right was free speech policies on campuses. And so what we were trying to do is um, think about okay, what is law enforcement's role in uh, you know understanding those policies and in some cases enforcing them. Um, if, you know, if protest becomes a, a situation where laws are being broken in, in addition to, you know, the campus policy. And then also, you know, what are, what are students' perspectives on law enforcement's role? And so we, you know, we understood that at the center of that, there are often administrators who are writing these policies. Um, and some of them are legislated, right? There's a lot of different states that are passing legislation that require institutions to say certain things within their campus free speech policy. Um, so it's, it's not entirely a to the administration always, but in many cases, it is administrators who are writing these policies, and then it's up to law enforcement to enforce them, and it's, you know, up to students to understand them and understand when a violation might occur. And so our goal there really was, and it's reflected in our title, is to bridge that gap between students' understanding of free speech policies on campus, as well as law enforcement, uh, campus law enforcement's understanding of those policies. So um, we had some really interesting findings, and I'll turn it over to Ali to start um, uh, with this first slide. Okay, so we looked at uh, our participants, right? Our participants were campus law enforcement as well as university students. Those were the two people that uh, participated in our focus groups and our interviews. We initially thought that it would be focus groups with uh, students as well as law enforcement, but what we found out is that interviews worked better with law enforcement because it's a it's much riskier to talk to us sometimes, um, and they're a little bit more hesitant to talk to us sometimes because they do have more risk. They may lose their job. They're scared of these things. Whereas students were more likely to talk to us because they want to share exactly how they feel about things. Um, the topics that we had chosen to talk to them about was specifically protest. How familiar are you with protests? Have you Students, have you participated in them? Officers, have you participated as, as working in the protests? Um, training and education. We differentiate the difference between training and education. Training for law enforcement, education for students. And then we went on to the campus free speech policy. How familiar are you with the campus free speech policy on for both uh, groups of participants? And then we talked about the violations enforced slash use of force, meaning do you know what violations can be enforced and what is the level of, of force that can be used? Um, we talked about the actions that are authorized by law enforcement. If you violate uh, certain things, what, do you know what law enforcement can use, specifically students? And actions um, by law enforcement, what actions can you use if a student violates certain things. Um, we had talked about actions allowable for students during a protest. How do you protest safely? How do you protest appropriately? Do law enforcement know what, what those things are? So we pretty much asked the same questions of both groups. Um, the themes that we found uh, in our research was uh, around campus policy. 
Um, do you know where your campus policy is located? How familiar are you with it? Same for both groups, students as well as law, as law enforcement. Um, the understanding of law enforcement's role in protest. Do students understand why law enforcement is there? And do law enforcement understand why they are put there for the protests? What constitutes protest violations? Same thing. Do students know what those violations are and when they violate things or violate the, the law um, or if they know uh, if they're violating policy? Same with law enforcement. Do you know what constitutes a violation? Um, protest training education, like we said, um, like I said earlier, we broke it down into students versus uh law enforcement officers, um, perception of use of force during protests. This was a really interesting find because uh, we gauged the student's perspective of what a law enforcement, the level of force a law enforcement can use, as well as when we talk to law enforcement, uh, their level of force and what they actually use and what they're capable of using um, and their perspe perception on administrators, the student's perspective, as well as the administrator's perspective. And we will go into it in um, our next slides. And using all of those themes and all the information that uh, we had collected, we, we produced a toolkit. And it's mainly recommendations for administrators based off all the themes that we had used. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah, thanks, Ellie. And so as a result of the, the findings that we had, um, which was, I think, arguably, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Ellie, but I think really it was that that um, we found that on the whole, that both law enforcement and students said that, yeah, I could Google it and I could find the free speech policy. But that, that on the whole, institutions, at least those that we were engaging with um, as far as students or law enforcement interviews and focus groups, were that they weren't doing a really great job of being proactive about uh, educating students about where to find this information and um, you know, like if they have questions about it, who they would who they would contact. And so what we did was a content analysis of the availability of campus free speech policies online. Uh, so what we did was look at 104 year public institutions, 104 year private institutions, and another 102 year community colleges. And what we were coding for is whether or not um, a the policy was accessible from the institution's homepage. So again, if you're sort of leaving it up to law enforcement and leaving it up to students to familiarize themselves with that policy, like how accessible is your policy? Um, and then when you do that search, right, and we were just going to the university's homepage and, and searching, you know, in the search function there, um, did the search take you to a free speech policy landing page where there was lots of resources and, you know, here's who you contact, or did it just take you to a policy that was like sort of a PDF and it's like, okay, good luck, read it, you know, um, and if you have questions, you know, figure that out. Um, we also, uh, you know, looked to see whether the policy listed a contact person, because again, if you're educating yourself about, hey, should I be participating in this protest? And like, what if the group that I'm with this Decides to, uh, you know, occupy a building, would I be held accountable as an individual protester, you know, because I was a part of that group? Um, you know, I think students really are trying to flesh out for themselves what might constitute a violation. And so um, to, to the extent that they want to know that information, how do we give them the tools to, to ask those questions? We also uh, assessed whether or not the policy mentions the use of force um, or links to a law enforcement use of force so students can, you know, be prepared about, you know, what might result in a use of force. We also talked about what might be um, a, or if, if the policy mentions what would constitute a violation of the policy. So staying in a building after hours or um, what the consequences are. And there were some, there were some policies that said things like, yes, you know, violation of this policy or any laws associated with a protest, you know, may have repercussions both criminally as well as through the student code of conduct. So we assessed for that. Um, and then we also just look to see how long the policy is, because again, knowing that, I mean, I, I shouldn't even say student attention spans because my attention span is also very short, especially if I'm reading a very legalistic document, um, you know, how long and how much do they have to slog through to get um, to, you know, what they're looking for within that policy or if they're trying to have a grasp of it. So in terms of those findings, we had 132 out of the 300 that had free speech policies that were searchable from the institution's homepage um, and another 168 without. Uh, there were 84 searches that took users to a landing page and 48 that linked directly to an institution's policy. So that was that was good news, right? That there was some sort of, um, you know, 
bigger effort uh, at play if, if someone searches for the institution's free speech policy. And then there were 59 institutions that mentioned what happens if someone t- were to violate the policy. So whether or not that was you know criminal legal action or whether or not that was a violation of the student conduct code, that they were very clearly laid out there. So it wasn't a lot, 59 out of you know the ones out of the 132 institutions whose policies were available. But I do think that that is a um, something that we pointed to as a promising practice that you know institutions could do better about letting students know. And, and the only other thing I'll say about that, and we can get into details and in, in, um, you know further further out, but like especially for international students, and I don't know if you agree with this, Ali, but that they were like really hesitant. We had some international students who were in our focus groups and they were very hesitant to uh, express any sort of, you know, um, freedom of speech because they were worried that if, you know, something went sideways that they could be, you know, given a conduct code violation and, um, you know, that could impact their visa status. And so I think it's really important for students to understand what constitutes constitutes a violation and then what the consequences of those violations might be if they decide to engage in protest but I'll turn it um, back over or we'll go to the next slide, sorry. Um, And so we have uh, some recommendations based on our findings. One is on education for students. Um, So we we talked to students, they seem to think that, you know, that training on the free speech policy could come during orientation or when major events are happening, right? Like last May um, around the murder of George Floyd and whether or not that, you know, whether or not if campuses knew their students were going to be protesting to do some sort of refreshers around, you know, what constitutes a violation. Um, They could also, you know, do training around and education around that policy um, and partner with law enforcement to do that training so that students, again, understand that law enforcement isn't necessarily there to stifle your free speech rights, that they are there to protect the students who are doing the, the protesting. And then also students talked about um, including case studies or sort of sort of experiential learning opportunities as part of the education. So um, giving them examples of what happens or what has happened um, in previous protests to sort of help them, um, you know, wrap their hands or wrap their brains around, you know, what what that looks like when it plays out on campus. And then I'll turn it over to you, Ellie. Yeah, I think uh, being educated on what you can and cannot do is so important for students, especially the international students, because they were just, as as you said, they were frightened to, to do anything. But if they know and know how to do it and understand that uh, it will not affect their visas, they might actually want to uh, protest um, and exercise their rights. Uh, I'm going to go on to the law enforcement portion, and it says require officers to be trained and annually on the free speech policy, along with the uses of uh, allowable force uh, to enforce violations of the law and the difference between the two. So to when officers get trained, it's usually we're gonna train you on the use of force, not necessarily on what the policy is of the campus. So to differentiate and to understand the two would be would be great training for officers and uh, to, to understand that uh, you may be able to use this level of force but you don't necessarily have to. That is also um, something that is super important also. If we, we can go, to go on to the slide. next slide. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Ali, sorry. So um, what we found out, the interesting part is uh, a lot of what students were talking about and what law enforcement were talking about is how administrators can support them. And uh, these are our findings um, to be strategic of, about deploying law enforcement during these protests. Where to put these law enforcement officers? Do they have to be in, in the middle of the crowd, especially if they're maybe protesting against police? Um, can they be behind the scenes? Can they be maybe like uh, in a close location where if something does happen, then they go in? Okay. Um, being trained on uses of force, the difference between violations of policy, which I talked about before. Administrators should also be trained on this and educated on this because if you're going to deploy an officer, is it because of a violation of policy or is it because of a violation of the law? So I think a a good example of this would be like a student is uh, using their cell phone in the library and they're not supposed to. It is the the policy that they're not supposed to. Do you send an officer in to say, hey, maybe you should stop using your phone? Um, Probably if if the student puts away the phone, but if the student gets angry, it escalates and takes a swing at the officer. Now it's a violation of the law. So 
when an administrator knows the difference, it, it might be very helpful to familiarize themselves with uh, and when, with when and why officers are authorized to use force. Same example. Say, for example, it, it escalates, it turns into something different. Um, administrators should should know those things. Uh, consider using non-law enforcement entities such as student response teams consisting of administrators or the student judicial affairs team to address policy violations. This is something that uh, when we talk to students and officers, they, they say that these teams exist and sometimes they work better than actually just sending an officer in there when it's a violation of policy. Um, hold themselves accountable to using the policy consistently during times of campus unrest and only for violations of the law, not policy. And I think, Jill, you had a really good example for this one. I might have, and I've since forgotten it. <laughs> so sorry about that. <laughs> I probably did have a really great example. <laughs> so um, I, I think uh, it, yeah, you, you were talking about uh, possibly like uh, if, you know, instead of deploying the police to everything, mm. uh, consider using other groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. I think, again, that it goes back to just my time being at UCSB and like, you know, if you, if they're occupying a building and that those building, you know, those, the, the building is open, you know, it's a public building, like again, sending in, you know, non-law enforcement entities to try to clear out the students might be a better option. Um, just because they're annoying you doesn't mean that that is the time to use law enforcement. So again, what, you know, back to your point, Ali, about the difference between uh, enforcing law and enforcing, you know, the, the institution's policy and who is sent out to to enforce both of those, I think is a really good distinction. Mm -hmm. And then just quickly, we wanna make sure that we get to your questions. So um, on our last slide here, um, the findings and recommendations that we have as far as the availability of your policy, if you are a campus administrator, or even if you're a student on this webinar, um, we encourage you to go to your institution's homepage and search for it, search free speech policy. Um, we didn't do, you know, we didn't have seven different search terms. We just used the one that we thought that students would be most likely to use. And, you know, is, is your institution's free speech policy accessible? Um, you know, can you take it to a landing page rather than directly to a PDF of the policy? Um, and then also including contact information for students or law enforcement officers. So students may have different questions, right, about the policy uh, and what constitutes a, constitutes a violation versus law enforcement officers who want to know, you know, whether or not use of force is ever allowable in certain, in certain circumstances. So having those contacts is really important for those who are wanting to access the policy. Also written in a language that is accessible to students. Um, this is something that, you know, when I've, I was a part of helping rewrite the, the Title IX policy um, when I was in the UC system and there was a plain language person who came in and said, okay, let's, let's take this to the level where, you know, anyone who can, um, who's not, you know, super invested in this can understand it. And that should be the case for free speech policies as well. Um, and this, I think, is again, back to our conversation with some of the international students that if you are working with a student population for whom English is not their first language, that language, like, the legalese can get really tricky for students who are trying to navigate what this means for whether or not they join a protest um, and the real, real consequences that they can, uh, you know, have if, if something, um, you know, were to go wrong during that protest. And then finally, um, ensuring that the policy specifically mentions conduct that is prohibited by the policy and the consequences, again, so that students have really a great, a great foundation about what they're getting into, right? And then if they see students starting to violate a policy or a law, they can make a decision at that point about whether or not to continue uh, with, you know, their participation in that event. So um, with that, that was our last set of slides. And I think we have other questions that we can answer with Michelle. Oh, I have so many questions, but first I want to say thank you. Um, I mean, I obviously am very invested in your work and think it's really interesting. Um, as a policy wonk, um, I'm particularly fascinated by the policy um, analysis because, I, you know, when I go out and do trainings, I always say to people, your policy is only as good as the number of people who are familiar with it. So if you have a policy and nobody knows what it is, then it's not very valuable. And then the next step, which is that, you know, if you have a policy and nobody knows about it or people know about it, but you don't apply it consistently, then you have another set of problems. So I, I think that you're really honing in on some, um, some really key factors. I guess, you know, I, I've been able to read um, the whole toolkit already. So I realize I have, um, I have an advantage. But one of the things that really struck me was how much overlap there was between the things that the students were telling you and the things that law enforcement were telling you. And I wanted to know if, if you were, both of you were surprised by that. And if you think that, 
students in law enforcement would be surprised to know that there was actually a lot of commonality. You wanna go first, Dad? I can. I can try to take this one first. Um, I think that there, it wasn't really surprising because I think working in law enforcement and and talking to to the people around me, um, it's very different from how the news might portray something. So, working a protest to see the the first protester that comes through to the very very last one might be a different perspective than you know you're standing in a protest and that uh, that's those are the same group as you are moving along. That's all you see. So. Um, and then also talking to law enforcement as well as students that have participated and law enforcement that have worked it, they both were saying, you know what, hey, we want to protest. And like law enforcement said, go ahead and protest. Students said, we want to protest. So there was really just like a lot of like, hey, we want to do this and we want to do this right. And they both were also talking about the groups that weren't there to to just protest the agitators and they were both groups were aware of them they were like yes there are people that aren't here to support the cause they are here to disrupt and the officers were like absolutely we need to stop those people that are disrupting and causing problems so the uh, very very common themes there yeah i think for me i i was surprised as a student affairs administrator because i think i think that you know they maybe just wanted different things so i was surprised um, I think some administrators might be surprised um, because I think a lot of the media narrative as well is centered around, you know, the the disruptions and when things go wrong between um, protesters and, and campus law enforcement. And yet, I, as Ali said, like the law enforcement overwhelmingly kept telling us over and over, we want the students to protest. Like I want, you know, one of the one of the ones that's quoted in the toolkit is saying like, I want my daughter who is in college to protest. Like that is not us being there is very rarely an indication that either the campus or that law enforcement as individuals or as a police force want students to not be there or to not protest. Like we are there to support and protect their right to protest. And I think, again, that the missing middle for us was that administrators don't do a good job of saying, hey, the reason that law enforcement are going to be there is to is that we heard that there's, you know, outside people coming in or that there's going to be counter protests and that might get, you know, disruptive. Um, and so it's really the idea that um, that students weren't communicated with about why why law enforcement were there. And actually, I would say some law enforcement said there's sometimes when we're sent to protest and we don't know why we're there. Like if it is designed to be peaceful, we don't need to be there. And yet administration is sending us to have a presence. Um, and so, again, the, the overlap was significant between the students and the law enforcement. But what was missing was um, communication through administration uh, to both law enforcement and student protesters. So, um, I, yeah, I think that's what was surprising to me is that, that both of them had the same goals and it was really a matter of a lot of times miscommunication by way of administration. Uh, well, okay. and unfortunately, you know, or fortunately, I guess, bad news sells, right? And I'm, I'm actually going to give a shout out to someone else in your class, um, Cassie Barnhart, who um, her study was about campus, campus mobilization tactics and the media. Um, and I don't want to, you know, be a spoiler, but I'm sure people won't be surprised that when bad things happened at protests, they were much more often amplified than when there was um, a peaceful protest without disruption. Um, so obviously, um, we have, you know, it's, it's kind of impossible to discuss campus law enforcement at this moment in time without discussing the movement to defund the police. And I realize the term defunding um, takes on different meetings for different people. But I was wondering if you could speak to how this concept arose um, in the context of your study. Um, and then I'll let people who are dropping their questions into the Q&A, we'll, we'll turn to you soon. Great. Well, I can start and then turn it over to you if that works for you, Ali. Sure. I think, you know, it's it certainly the defund movement was not a like was not the focus of our study. I would say that we did have um, just, I think only one student who was very clear at the beginning and said, look, I don't, you know, we can talk about law enforcement's role in protests, but I, I don't think they need to be, I don't think we need to have campus law enforcement. So she was like sort of upfront about like, yeah, we can talk in this hypothetical, um, but my, you know, my goal would be to not have them there. But I think, um, you know, the, the idea, uh, I think, we didn't really push students on that because, again, it wasn't the focus, but I would say where there is, um, there's room for, I think, a little push on students' behalf is that they, 
there were on several occasions, students who said, look, we want um, police there if there's going to be counter protesters. And so they want them there if they feel like they're being protected, but the, they don't want them there if they feel like, hey, I'm here for a peaceful protest. I think the missing piece for them was like administration may know that there's going to be counter protests. And so that's why law enforcement has been um, deployed to this certain, um, you know, this certain you know, demonstration or protest. Um, and yet they very much articulated that they wanted law enforcement there if there were going to be counter protesters so that they could protest safely. So when they feel like that law enforcement is on their side and is there to protect their freedom of speech, they're for them being there. Um, and so I think that was a, like a key sort of, again, overlap of when they wanted them there. The other thing that I would say too, is that um, there was not a real clear designation around like when things turn to the point where there should be law enforcement involvement. And we, and again, we did sometimes try to like press students on like, tell me more about this. Like when your right to free speech prevents the right of someone else to access their education, is that still okay? Or is that an instance in which law enforcement should come in? And there just was not a lot of, um, I think they just really hadn't thought about it. They really struggled with that question when we sort of pushed back. And so for us, I think there was, um, I think there's a lot of times where students recognize the need for law enforcement, but it gets sort of wrapped up in the conversation that, um, you know, I hear my, my friends saying this and all of that, but like when you talk to them about what that actually means, it looks very different. And I will also say that like, you know, from the, my background in sexual assault, that there are survivors who definitely rely on law enforcement on campus. And, um, you know, I was at, I, I've been at two institutions now where we've had mass shootings and without campus law enforcement to respond within seconds. Um, and again, if you ask students about that, they'll sort of concede that fact of like, yeah, there would have been more lives lost had there not been an on-campus response to that. Um, but, you know, like I said, we were focusing more on, on freedom of speech. And, and so we didn't really get into to the defund a lot. It just, we had these conversations that were sort of tangential to like, yes, you would need them there for this. Um, so I don't know if you have different thoughts, Allie. No, they, I, I think you covered uh, exactly what we plan to talk about with this. Um, I think defunding the police is a great topic to talk about. It's a great conversation to have. It just wasn't uh, anything that the more, lots of students brought up just one and it was about like an excited utterance in front of uh in front of us and says just so you know i am about defunding the police and we said okay we didn't push her any further because you know we can have the conversation about okay so um what does that look like or you know what happens if there is an active shooter who would handle that like we would love to talk about those things and open conversations about that but it just wasn't uh there wasn't time in our in our you know, time allotted to talk about our protests as well as that. So we just kind of like uh, acknowledged it and then we moved on. Well, Michelle, can I just also add that we were really um, like as from a research perspective, we were very uh, cognizant of not saying what Allie's role was. I mean, if someone wanted to go look her up on the fellow's website, they obviously would have known she was law enforcement. But in order to not stifle that conversation, I know there's probably some people here being like, well, of course they didn't say defund the police. Like one of the researchers is, is an, you know, an officer. And so, um, but we were really clear to not introduce that into the, the discussions with students because we didn't want to stifle anybody who wanted to share that kind of point of view. Okay, no, I think that's a really um, interesting and important fact. And um, we have some questions coming in, but um, I, I especially, you know, Jill, as someone who is now working for a national organization of administrators, I mean, like you said, your, your piece is called Minding the Gap, Administrator's Role in Reducing Tensions Between Campus Law Enforcement and Student Activists. And I don't know that I would have guessed that the people in the gap would be identified as administrators. And I'm curious, again, if, if you were surprised um, or not by that. Um, yeah, I really was. And again, I, it's maybe just something that because, you know, everyone's busy, students are busy, law enforcement is busy, administration is busy. But I think, you know, in some cases, it's like, oh, yeah, we know we have to have a policy. So we're going to write it. And then we're, you know, going to put it over here in this PDF. And we don't really care. But like, when when it becomes a very, you know, like lived reality of students and what they can participate in or not. And I just like sort of centering students at it, which is, I, you know, my, my go-to because I've worked in student affairs so long. But like, when I think about those students who really don't understand the consequences or don't understand, you know, what that boundary might be. And there are those who are going to say, look, the students get it. They know what the boundary is and they're going to push it because that's the role of protest, right? And that's one of our student participants even said that, like the goal is to agitate, right? Um, the goal is to push the boundaries. But I do think there are students who would participate more um, if they knew what those boundaries are. And so I think um, it just goes back to your point earlier, Michelle, that, you know, you, 
you can have the best laid plans and the best written policies, but if nobody understands how they play out, um, then it doesn't really do a lot of good. And I think we heard over and over again, both from students and law enforcement, that um, law enforcement are often utilized in cases where the law is not being broken. Like it's an administrator that doesn't want someone, um, you know, doing X, Y, or Z. And I think about some of the really high profile cases where you've had students of color, like law enforcement sent out to, you know, a lounge because somebody was, you know, a student who had a right to be there. And yet, like, we don't talk about the fact that like it was someone, I mean, they do talk about it quite a bit, but like that it was someone who called on that student. But if you are an administrator, you know, I think you need to take a step back in that instance and be like, okay, so tell me what law is being broken and then we'll make a determination about who will respond. And I think um, there's an over-reliance and Ali, you can tell me if you're wrong, but from what we heard, there's an over-reliance on Oh, yeah, just send in law enforcement, like send in campus law enforcement. And I think it's because, you know, in the campus setting, at least in my experience, students sometimes do form strong relations, relationships with some of those campus law enforcement officers. Some of them, you know, have, you know, periods where they work in the residence halls and that kind of thing. And so I do think that there's this sense that they're a softer, um, you know, type of law enforcement officer than, you know, someone from the local city who would come in um, and address the situation. But I, I, I still think having someone show up in uniform when you're not doing anything wrong as a student, um, whether you're protesting or, you know, hanging out in a lounge, that that is a misuse of campus law enforcement that I think happens way too frequently. Um, I don't know if you agree with that, Ali, but. Yeah, I think that goes very well with uh, John Summerlot's question about uh, sending in other groups. And I think absolutely, if it's a violation of policy, um, absolutely send send in other groups because I think it might be able to be addressed better that way also. So like, um, I was gonna read his question, but I think it just disappeared off of my screen. But uh, he was just saying there was like different uh, groups that was sent in and it was successful. And I think it very well could be successful. Um, my only fear is that if it escalates, then what happens? And I would love to talk about what happens and do you send in one person as administrator and one person as law enforcement to, to address different situations? That could be a possibility too. So yeah, I, I agree. And I'm gonna actually ask um, a Paul's question and just to see if you have a sense, cause he was asking whether or not you got the feeling that students understood that law enforcement doesn't always know if they're going to be agitators or disruptors at a peaceful protest. Um, or if you think they sort of, yeah, you know, do you think they were, they, that they take that, they were taking that into consideration that it might not be planned. Like they might not know, they might have not have expected it. Absolutely. I think like if, if, you know, you can only have so much intel and you can only do so much because of how much intel you have. So if, you know, you always plan for the worst and hope for the best, right? So if you plan that maybe there might be and officers are just far enough away so that they're not part of, you know, um, the protest, uh, not close enough to be part of the protest. And if something does happen, they're able to come in and, and do something about it. So if you put administrators where uh, you would normally put officers in the middle of a protest, then maybe administrators can handle certain things. And then if an officer needs to handle something, then they can come in and handle those things. Yeah, and I think that part of that, again, goes back to education and training, right? So if students know, hey, every time there's a protest, we're going to have officers sort of standing by. Um, please know that they are there to protect your right to do whatever it is you're here to do. But if anybody else comes in and they're, you know, if there are counter protests or outside groups, um, then that's why they are there and they'll be sort of standing by. But uh, the conversation isn't often focused on um, here's why we will be utilizing law enforcement. And one of, one of the officers said, like, I, I think administrators just don't do a great job of saying, like, hey, like, here's orientation, we're going to talk about free speech, and we're going to talk about law enforcement's role in protecting your free speech. And they were like, if they had this conversation with students with us as partners, they were like, then it wouldn't be an us versus them. And that, that, that again, is the missing middle that administrators could really do a better job about in terms of, um, like, it is administration in partnership with law enforcement, um, making sure that students are protected. Um, and I think that that gets missing, but it's something to, that Ali was talking about earlier in terms of like standing in the wings, you know, we, we heard from one officer who said, um, we knew that there were going to be people from outside the campus coming into protest. And our administration told us that we needed to um, arrest them for trespass. And he was like, I, I uh, he's like, it's a, it's a 
public institution. So I, I felt really um, uncomfortable with that. Right. And yet, you know, like this is, you know, he was a newer officer and he just said, you know, this was really a struggle for me because I thought if I do that, like I am not, you know, upholding the law. And it was just because the administration didn't want to be sort of annoyed by outsiders coming in or wanted to preemptively prevent something from escalating. And so again, the idea that, um, you know, you, like this is a very real policy for, law enforcement and they have to know what's policy and what's law. And, and then the administration has to be there to back them up, you know? Um, no, I think that's a really key point. I mean, I, I've done a little bit of work in this area being part of um, free expression committees that are reworking policies. And, you know, there've been other officers who've said, you know, what happens if you're at a, a university where there really isn't great communication between law enforcement and administrators, because it's not always easy, especially for folks that aren't sort of at the top of a, you know, police department on campus to say, you know, hey, you know, dean of students or hey, vice chancellor of student affairs. I'm not really sure that that's the appropriate use of law enforcement. So I think that can probably be really tricky. Um, Anna had a question about, you know, whether you've got the sense that students really valued free speech um, and, you know, how campus is handled when students were looking for laws or codes in an effort to shut down speech. Um, and I don't know if you got a sense of whether it was sort of just I like free speech when it's what I you know agree with or whether there was a broader feeling of like, I understand why we have to protect ugly perspectives that I disagree with. I, I don't know what you would say, Ali, but I think I would say that they they struggle with that line. And I, you know, the research, you know, like we, we cited research in our um, toolkit as well, that it was like, yeah, students are all for free speech as long as it's their, their free speech. And I would say that what that, how that played out in our research is that it followed on that that's how they felt about law enforcement involvement. Like, yes, I want law enforcement there if um, people that I disagree with are coming and they're going to counter protest. I mean, literally, that's what they said to us, you know, but like, but if we're protesting and it's supposed to be peaceful, why does law enforcement need to be there at all? And it was like, Okay, so we didn't we didn't really sort of go down that road of like, well, can't they also be there to protect the you know the counter protesters that you don't want there? Um, but they they didn't they they didn't they really struggled with that distinction, I would say, um, and it, it follows that like their understanding of the role of law enforcement also follows that you know like you're there to protect my free speech, <laughs> not necessarily people that I disagree with. I don't, did you get that sense, Ali? That was my understanding of what they felt. Yeah, I did. I think um, many times we heard like, OK, so if you were in class and there was a protest outside and you can no longer, you know, get your education and you paid all this money to get your education, should we should we say that the officers should go stop them? And they said, yes. OK, so what if you were the protester? Should officers stop you? No, it's my right to protest. So they were they were super torn when when mm -hmm. it came to that. Um, and I think that highlights, you know, I mean, this is why one of the reasons, you know, we have the center and one of the things I really think about a lot, which is like, how do we make, how do we persuade students today, especially in sort of the hyper polarized like world that we live in, that there is value in protecting not only speech that they disagree with, but speech that most people would agree with is really offensive. And I think that's one of the struggles is that, you know, you have to, you can't do that in, you know, 250 characters on Twitter. You have to really sit down in an ideal world, likely with administrators and students and law enforcement, right, to talk about these things um, together. Um, and, and it's a challenge. Um, another question that came in was just whether people were reticent to speak with you. I know you mentioned that in the beginning. Um, and if there were some certain techniques you used to encourage them to be kind of forthright or was it just more organic? I would say that students were very forthcoming. I think they're used to being asked their opinions, um, you know, and, and to be fair, like students' jobs weren't on the line if they felt like they said something, you know, about administrators. <laughs> um, it's students' favorite thing to, you know, talk about how um, administrators don't do things right. So um, I think they were, you know, very comfortable talking with us. And again, we didn't, you know, put Allie in the room as, you know, a law enforcement officer. So they didn't feel like anything they said against law enforcement was, you know, hurting her feelings. Um, and, but I would say, you know, that the law enforcement officers were much more reticent to talk to us and which is why we moved from focus groups to interviews. And I think um, there's a culture of fear about, 
uh, saying the wrong thing, at, you know, I get it. It's, and, and, and this would be for any employee, but I think also during this time where, um, you know, like relations with law enforcement are really fraught. Uh, and this happened during, you know, in the year since most of our, our focus groups were um, that, you know, since George Floyd and, and everything, all of the nationwide protests. And so I think there was a very realistic and, and understandable hesitation on their part. The ones that talked to us, though, I think were really great and forthcoming and had such good things to say, but getting them in the room was difficult. I, I, I don't know if you have thoughts about that too, Ali, but. I think uh, the officers, they, they wanted to be prepared when they talked to mm -hmm. us. They wanted to be like, okay, so here's here's our policy. This is where I can find it. This is what happens. This is our training. It, it was almost like, you know, they, they were speaking on behalf of their department. So we had a lot of like, okay, so let's break it down. Let's maybe we're, tr we're trying to probe them into certain things. And after we got through and say that, hey, this is this is anonymous. We're not going to use your name. We're not even going to use your institution. Um, they opened up a little bit more. And um, we, the more we talked about it, the more comfortable they got. And the more they knew that we were not trying to expose them, they opened up a lot more. Whereas the students were like, okay, so, you know, after this, I might go and try to figure out what my free speech policy is. So theirs was like, okay, we learned something from this and, and we might go do this. And you know what? I normally protest and I don't know exactly what the policy is, you know? So what, the, what we found out was they were learning from the the leaders of the protest. They were getting information from, from those that were conducting the protest on how to protest. And it might not necessarily fall in with policy. Yeah. Well, and I, I also just like, Ali is always um, very humble, but like her being in the room was absolutely the credibility that we needed to get law enforcement to open up with us. And, you know, was the, the reason that we partnered on this project is that um, I know there was a trust level there with her leading some of those questions when we were doing the law enforcement interviews that I would not have been able to do, you know, without her. Um, and, and I agree with Ali that like one of the really fascinating things we found was that law enforcement would come to these focus groups and be like, okay, I know where to find it. And they kind of felt like it was a pop quiz about like, okay. And then like, you know, is use of force allowable in this instance? And so they like had prepared before they came and then students, you know, I think this was a learning process for them and they were going to subsequently follow up to find their policy. But um, the, the scary thing, I think, for me sitting in an, in an administrator seat is if you leave that education to students to educate themselves, you, you know, it's like a game of telephone, you know, like you're, you're relying on someone who may have looked at the policy, may have understood it. And now they're going to educate all the people that they want to come and protest with them. And the information that's shared, I think is not always accurate about like, they can't do this to you and they can't. And it's like, okay, but like if they can, or, you know, again, if it's a peaceful protest and one person takes a swing at an officer and then it becomes a shutdown situation, um, you know, like what does, and that's not necessarily a great example because I don't know that's what would happen, but um, you know, what are the consequences for you? And again, what, what they tell one another is maybe not necessarily what I think administrators would hope that they would know about the consequences of engaging. Um, all right, thank you. I want to um, make sure we get to maybe one or two more questions because we're coming up towards the end. Um, Sandra Rodriguez, who's an amazing administrator, um, has asked a really interesting question about whether you think students, administrators, and police understand that we're all caretakers of public space. Obviously, we're talking about public campuses and how that caretaking manifests um, with the groups. And, 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 you know, she's asking, do you think we can come to respect those, that role as a caretaker of the public space? I would say law enforcement. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ellie. I've been no, 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 no. Go much. ahead. I was just going to ask for clarification of the question, but go ahead. I, I would just say, I think law enforcement very much understands that, right? Like there were law enforcement officers that were like, we're protecting the buildings from, you know, like being damaged during a protest. And so I think they understand that role very clearly. I think, again, the struggle for students is... Um, I, I understand this in so much as like, I have a right to do this, but I don't quite understand where that line is when my right to protest and um, be loud impacts the ability of someone else to have access to their education. I think that's um, where they, where administrators could do a better job of like, you know, yeah, we want you to do this, but we also want everyone to be able to access education while you're doing this. Allie, did you want to add anything I, before I, we go to close or now? Oh, I was just going to say that absolutely. Like, um, you know, we all live in this space, right? We all get educated in this space. We are all part of this space. And to respect uh, 
the space of others is so important. And I think after talking to many of these students in law enforcement that respecting each other's space and understanding what, what will hurt another person is, is super important. And that might make better space for protesting. Um, so I see where we are at the time. I apologize if we weren't able to get to your question, though Ali and Jill have generously offered when we send the follow-up email with this recording that you can reach out to them on their individual emails. Claire asks where we can access the research. So um, the center will be releasing um, all fellows research later this week, and then you will be able to dig into their incredible study. And I just wanna say that how much I've learned um, from both Jill and Ali. Um, there's a reason why I call them a dynamic duo because I do think your partnership was able to, you know, create a lot of trust for different stakeholders to come and speak. Um, and Allie knows I always want to ask her tons more questions. Um, and I think that there's lots of opportunity to build on this, to do other studies and to create um, more opportunities for learning. So I really want to thank um, both of our speakers. Um, such a privilege to have them as part of um, the fellows program. And I want to remind people they can look forward, hopefully on Thursday to um, getting more of the um, research and also mark your calendars. Um, our next fellows in the field workshop will feature work by Nina Flores on her research topic, which is tweets, threats, and censorship, supporting faculty through incidents of targeted harassment. That will take place on July 21st at noon Pacific Standard Time. Until then, um, stay healthy, stay cool, um, and have a great afternoon.